third grade may be dismissed to Children's Church. I want to draw your attention to Luke chapter 6, if you're staying in here. The last several weeks, we have been proverbially standing on the plain with Jesus and his disciples and studying through Luke's version here as Jesus preaches this sermon, a kind of condensed sermon to this crowd. It's a condensed sermon as compared to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, which is the longer version of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the Sermon on the Plain. I want to go back to verse 20. I feel like I'm a little loud up here. Tenley, if you want to turn me down, I don't want to yell at people. Um, I want to go back to verse 20, and we're going to read the sermon in its entirety, okay? So we're going to look at the closing pictures that uh, Jesus gives us as he lands the plain, as I say, like sometimes when I'm preaching, I'm going, how am I going to land this plane? Sometimes you guys are thinking, pastor, land the plane. Come on, you're there. Um, so verse 20, and he, Jesus, lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did, did to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful. Even as your Father is merciful, judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. 
For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Let's pray together. Father, we look to you and we thank you for this sermon that we've now studied for several weeks. And and as we come to the close of it, Lord, we need your help. We need your help for making decisions. Father, when Jesus preached this sermon, when he stood on that plain... And he spoke it to his disciples. There were others listening in. So both his disciples and those hearers beyond the disciples, Father, uh, we know that there was a decision to be made. And so even today, as we continue and close out our study of this sermon, we know there are decisions to be made. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would give us ears to hear. God, we, we confess that sometimes we come to the church service, and our ears may be closed off to the word, to what your spirit would say to us. Oh, Father, will you be so gracious and merciful to us today to open our ears? Oh, Father, not to look on our brother or sister around us, but, God, to look in our own heart, at our own soul, and to do a little fruit inspection, to, to see, Lord, have we and are we building our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ? Or have we taken shortcuts? And have we skipped that? And are we trying to live this Christian life without Christ? So Lord, whatever whatever your spirit wants to do in these moments that we spend together studying, Father, we pray that you would do it with power, with might. And Father, we know that you alone have the power and the might to change us and to transform us. So do your work, Lord, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, we come to the question this morning that I want to begin with, and this is the question. Why does Jesus preach this sermon? Why does Jesus preach this message at this time in his ministry? So I want us to look contextually at where we've been in our study Prior to beginning this sermon, Jesus is being hounded by the Pharisees. So you remember back in in previous um, uh, context of uh, Luke 6, verse 20, you remember back before then where Jesus was, he was being hounded by the Pharisees. Okay, they the Pharisees are nitpicking him and his disciples over the fact that they don't adhere to the Pharisaical interpretation of the law. Uh, so, so remember, they've, they've criticized Jesus and his disciples. They criticized him for harvesting on the Sabbath. Right? Remember, they're walking through the grain fields, and they're picking wheat, the disciples are, and, and they're, they're rubbing the, the wheat together, and they're gathering the grain, and they're eating it. And they're, the, the Pharisees, according to their interpretation of the law, say, hey, th- this is harvesting, winnowing harvesting on the Sabbath. You are breaking God's law. So they're, they're giving them grief about that. And then on the Sabbath, Jesus heals. He heals on the Sabbath. Uh, And and they come at him um, uh, about that. And then then they come at him for not fasting. You remember uh, he he, uh, goes, he calls Levi. We know him as Matthew. and, And Jesus is in the house of Levi eating a meal with sinners and tax collectors, right? He's eating with notorious sinners and tax collectors. And they accuse him uh, regarding that. And they accuse him of not fasting and praying as the Pharisees prescribed. So, so we take all of that context and, and we hold it up to this sermon now on the plane. And we can better understand why Jesus preached this message. 
the, the religious air, the religious air that the Jews breathed reeked of critical, judgmental, and condemnatory spirit that Jesus is exposing in this sermon. Like, you know what I'm talking about, right? When, when I talk about the air they breathed, was, it, just, it just had the stench of judgment, of, of being critical and, and a, a spirit, a stench of condemnation, right? I, I mean, you drive down our country roads, Right, right, and and you 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 go down 223 a little bit here, and you're going into Adrian, and, and man, you're kind of turning the corner. You get around the farm, the farmlands, and and who you know what I'm talking about? The air, the air they breathe. It, it had that stench of judgment, that stench of condemnation. We you go down 223, and and you, know, you inhale too deeply, your gut will turn, okay? Because there is a deep stench. So that that kind of stench is in the air that they breathed in Jesus' day. Like this was the air that the Pharisees, the, the, the religious elite of the day, they created this air of condemnation, of, of judgment, of criticism. Where they went around and, and nitpicked everybody, and it was stifling. Right? You got out some of the farmlands, and I'm, hey, hey, it's necessary, right? We, we get food from our farm, so it's necessary in that case. But here, this, this judgment, this This air of criticism, this air of condemnation was not necessary. It was uh, was stifling, and it just just sucked the life out of all who breathed it. So, So every way Jesus turns, there are critics picking him apart, picking apart his disciples, berating them. This is the stench, the air, uh, the stench in the air that they breathed. It made me stop and ask this question of myself and and of our culture and our community is, is this stench, is the stench of a critical and condemning spirit among us, right? right? Is that in my heart? Does that critical, condemning spirit exist in me? Like like this calls for us to to self-reflect, and that is Jesus' point, right, church? Like, like, does does this pharisaical spirit live in me? And I say, there's, there's, a, there's a little Pharisee that lives in me, right? Sometimes he's bigger than I want him to be. And sometimes he's just there. I don't want him to be there, right? And so I think at some level, at, at various times, we can all struggle with this. Uh, when, when, we get, when we get ourselves all knotted up about something, something we don't like, somebody's offended us, Somebody's done something against us. Somebody hasn't done something that we expected them to do. Somebody has said something or somebody hasn't appreciated us. And we get, whatever the case is, we, we get all knotted up about it. And, and it doesn't take much for our speech to become critical. We, and we place ourselves in a position of, of judge and jury over another person, never stopping to think that we don't know the full story. Nor, nor have we walked in the other person's shoes. Oh, we have to be very careful about this. Like our criticism can easily open up like the skies over Florida. Like I've, I've lived in Florida 25, 26 years, and, and in August, the, the air in Florida is stifling. Like it's 110 degrees, 100 degrees, whatever it is. It's, the humidity is, um, is incredibly thick. You don't think it can get any thicker, right? But, but every afternoon... Sometimes like clockwork, the skies will, oh, the skies will open up and the, the, just a torrential downpour comes and, and the air that you didn't think could get any thicker than it already was, and it, it somehow finds a way. And in 30 minutes, 30 minutes the rainstorm is gone and the air is thicker and you can just, just sitting still, you can feel the sweat begin to form on your forehead. Like, like, if we're not careful, uh, when we get all knotted up and we, we take on a critical spirit, we can be like one of those Florida afternoon storms, right? We, we, we just open up and, and our mouths just give off a flood of critical, condemnatory speech. And, and man, it's stifling. It's stifling when that happens. And, and we affect others around us. And, and we show ourselves to be miserable in such cases. So, so in this sermon, uh, one of the lessons Jesus is teaching us is to take care of the air we breathe. Like, what, is, what are we contributing to the air? 
Well, how am I contributing to the air? How are you contributing to the air in your home, in your, in your uh, marital relationships, in your relationship with your kids, your coworkers, uh, whoever? Well, how are we contributing to the air, the atmosphere around us? Are we being critical? Are we being condemnatory? See, the, the, the admonition here is to, is to examine our own hearts. Jesus is saying citizens of my kingdom, his kingdom, are to live mirroring the mercies of our heavenly Father. Is mercy the, the, the atmosphere of my own spirit? Is grace growing in my own spirit? Is that what I long to extend to others? Mercy and grace and kindness. That's a struggle for us. It's a struggle for me. I venture that I'm not alone, that it's a struggle for you as well. Jesus has told us plainly that his blessings are reserved for those with humble hearts. We go back to the early verses of this sermon. Those who are poor in spirit, you have a, a poverty of heart. Uh, you're a beggar before God. You, you come to God and you say, God, I have nothing to bring to you. I need grace, God. I need, I need the bread crumbs from your table. I need your righteousness. I, I, I have no goodness of my own. God says, blessed are you when you come to me with that kind of spirit, with that kind of heart, mourning over your own sin. And, and then he says, such people will be hated. If you're going to live that way, this world will hate you. This world will, will excuse, exclude you. They will revile you. They will scorn you because of your association with Jesus. And so the Spirit of Christ produces in the believer an increasingly merciful heart. And out of this heart of mercy, we are to love our enemies, mirroring back to the world a demonstration of the heart of and the love of God for them and for us. So who might Jesus have been speaking about in this sermon? Who might he have had in mind? Well, is it a stretch, given the context, to think that he had the Pharisees in mind? And I think this helps us to bridge the gap to these, these visuals at the end of his sermon. Like, like, what does the blind, leading the blind, have to do with loving your enemies? What does is, what is, what is a master and his disciple, and, and a disciple would become like his master, what does that have to do with everything Jesus has been talking about? Well, if we understand that, that this, this air is, is happening, Jesus is preaching this sermon within the context of a pharisaical culture, a, a, a culture that is stifling with condemnation, with judgment, and the Pharisees are chief among the judges. Right, when we understand that, we can begin to understand why Jesus preaches this sermon. The Pharisees were not poor in spirit. They thought of themselves as spiritually rich. The Pharisees were not hungry for righteousness, not the righteousness of God. They were quite satisfied with their own righteousness, right, their own efforts. The Pharisees were not saddened over their own sin. They didn't mourn and grieve over their sin. No, no, they, they thought they were good. They, they, they prided themselves in being good. They were intent on using God's law to control others and to, to heap condemnation. Now, the Pharisees went about hating and excluding and reviling and scorning Jesus and his followers and would ultimately lead the charge in the condemnation and crucifixion of Jesus. The Pharisees loved those who loved them, right? They loved the natural way. They loved those who loved them. They did good to those who did good to them. They lent to those who could pay them back. They loved the natural way. Jesus says, what benefit is that to you? If you love like the natural man, the Pharisees were critical, condemning, unforgiving, and greedy for selfish gain. So this brings us to the five pictures that call on each of us to check ourselves here. So, so these five pictures at the end of Jesus' sermon, is, it's, it's a call for self-examination. Like, like not, not thinking about our neighbors, not thinking about that person who did you wrong, not thinking about anybody else but, but you, and I'm thinking of me. Right? And so with that mindset, we look 
at these pictures. The first two pictures focus on choosing and following. Choosing and following. Verses 39 and 40. And I'm just going to recap these quickly because I did cover these somewhat last week. But 39 and 40, these talk about choosing and following. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? So, so here's picture number one is blind guides. You, you, if you choose a blind leader, a blind guide, where will that blind guide lead you? Well, Jesus says he's going to lead you into a pit. That pretty simple stuff, right? It, 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 if you... My listeners, Jesus say, imagine Jesus on the, on the plane and he's preaching. If you, my listeners, choose a blind guide, you will fall into a pit with them. That's where they will lead you. And the, the Pharisees were blind guides. Chuck Swindoll tells of a time when he was in the Marine Corps and his ship was at the northeastern corner of what is now called Taiwan. They stopped there at the mouth of the harbor and waited the arrival, waited for the arrival of the harbor pilot who came out and took the wheel of the ship and began to weave them through the pathless waters that led to the dock itself. Swindoll recounts, he says, at first glance, that seemed like an unnecessary thing to do. Those aboard the ship, they, we could see the dock, he says. It's less than a mile ahead. But the closer they looked and the longer they looked over the side of the ship into the cl crystal clear waters... He says, we discovered why we needed guidance. There were mines located randomly beneath the surface of the waters. He says, if the hull of the ship had nudged a mine just enough, disaster would have occurred. But then he says, but the pilot, the harbor pilot, knew where every single mine was located. See, see what, those, what, what that ship needed was a set of eyes that understood where they needed to go and to guide them to get there. And a blind guide, surely taking them through that minefield in the waters, would have led to disaster. And so just like that ship needed a guide with clear vision, you and I need the same. And so Jesus is saying, choose carefully who you will follow. Like, like is Jesus your rabbi, your master teacher? Is, is Jesus your savior? Is Jesus your Lord? Not just by words, but, but by life. Are you and I truly following after Jesus? Are we truly understanding, seeking to understand, Lord, what is your will? Because my heart, I want to do the will of my teacher, my master, my rabbi. Jesus, in Matthew 15, said to Peter about the Pharisees, he said, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. And so of the Pharisees, he says, let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And what is that pit? What is that pit? Ultimately, it's the pit of hell. Because the Pharisees did not have the way to God. They thought they did. They boasted that they knew the way to God. But, but their way to God was through their own self-effort, their own self-righteousness, their own goodness. No, 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 friends. Jesus says, pour yourself on my mercies and I will save you. I will forgive you of your sins. You have nothing to bring to me that, I, that, can, that can save you. You need my grace. So be careful who you choose to follow. Be careful that you choose Jesus. Picture number two is verse 40. It's misguided teachers, right? Misguided teachers, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. So this, this picture is closely related to verse 39. Not only will blind guides lead us to fall into the pit of destruction, but we will become like them. A along the way, as they lead us down this path of destruction towards the pit, we will, be, we will become like them as we follow them. And so Matthew 10, 24 says this, Jesus says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they called if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? 
So, so like to, to, the, to the followers of Jesus, he's saying, you're going to follow me. They've called me the devil. They said, my works are of the devil. And if you follow me, how much more will they say of your works that your works are of the devil? And they, they, they'll be blind to the reality of the truth. And so choose your spiritual teachers carefully, knowing that you will become like them. Now, we need spiritual teachers who point us to Jesus. I, I trust that we all, all of us who know Christ as our Savior, we want to be that kind of teacher, uh, even though you might not call yourself a teacher, but that kind of guide who, who as you're walking through your life following Jesus, others can come along confidently and follow you. Now, none of us does that perfectly, right? None of us does that perfectly, and yet, we want to grow in the spirit of Christ to, to, so that we are not misleading other people. So there exi- exists in our day, in our technologically advanced day, both a blessing and a danger, right? We have the blessing of having videos and audio sermons at, at will. We can look up spiritual teaching from all, over, all around the world. That, that can be a blessing. It, it can also be a danger, right? Because we don't know, we don't know the heart of that YouTube preacher. Uh, but, but we are to know the heart. We are to know the character. We are to get to know the, the true authenticity of those teachers among us who live among us and invest their lives in uh, being teachers and preachers of the Word of God. Uh, Pictures number three and four, focus on seeing and being. So we have have choosing and following, pictures three and four, verses 41 through 45, seeing and being. We'll read it again. Verse 41, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in, take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So so you notice that these two pictures, they're they're two separate pictures, but they go together. The word for, at the beginning of verse 43, links them together. It it really could read because. Like, like why do you, why do you, you, you're, you're, you, you, You try to surgically remove the the splinter from your brother's eye. Meanwhile, you're carrying around a log in your own eye. Why do you do that? Because no good tree bears bad fruit. right? So they're connected together. But but they're focused on seeing and being. Picture number three is you could put in that blank splinter inspectors or spec inspectors. The Pharisees were focused on what they saw as unattractive about others according to their own self-righteous standards. So so God had given his law and the Pharisees had taken that law and and they had warped it with all of their self-righteousness, all of their self-righteous standards. They they could pick out the growth of a nose hair peeking out of a person's nostril from 200 yards, right? But they couldn't see the bush growing out of their own nose. It's gross, isn't it? I intentionally put that illustration there. I don't want to lose you. And he's like, whoa. And they could, they could pick the speck of sawdust out of somebody else's eye, but they're blind to the lumber yard sticking out of their own. See, see what, what we are most critical about concerning others around us, this might sting a little. What we are most critical about concerning others around us is oftentimes what we are most guilty of ourselves. Ooh. So, so, what do, so now this calls for me to listen to my own speech, to be understanding of my own thinking, 
with regards to criticism and judgment and condemnation towards others. Like what, I'm, what I tend to focus on could possibly be, what you tend to focus on, could possibly be the very things that we ourselves struggle with. It's called, it's called deflection and blame shifting. Right? Somebody says something to you and you, you turn the tables. You say, oh yeah, I saw you do that the other day. Right? And so we, we sometimes tend to do that. We need to make sure that we check ourselves before we go over and wreck another and ultimately wreck ourselves too. Like, like check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? That, that's good. That you write that down. But, but in checking ourselves, we'll refrain from wrecking others. If we can have some healthy self examination and understand our own sins. Uh, picture number four is fruit inspectors. Fruit inspectors. The emphasis of this picture is not on how we auto inspect the fruit of others, but our own fruit. Like, like do some fruit inspection on our own lives. Like, what's growing out of my of the rooted the root of my heart? What's growing out of out from underneath the surface of my own soul? Like, what is happening out here? Is the product of what is happening in here. Okay, so, so when we're bent, when we're resentful, when we're angry out here, all of that is conjured up from inside the heart. So, so you notice that Jesus, Jesus is emphasizing inspecting the heart. Yeah, we do fruit inspection, but as we look at the fruit of our lives out here, the, the, the attitudes, the, the behaviors... That we, that we exhibit in our lives, we look at that, we, we, we pick some of that fruit, and where did that come from? Where did that come from? What was the motivation? Even, even what looks like our good fruit, we can pick it off there. What was the motivation behind that? Oh, it was, I wanted, I wanted people to see my goodness. Not the goodness of God, but I wanted to see my goodness. This is, this is very sobering stuff, right? This is the hard work, but the, the, the work that Jesus calls us to do to inspect our own lives. What grows on the branches of our lives, our behavior, is a product of what is going on underneath the soil in our soul. That is our heart. What's going on in the heart always directly impacts the kind of fruit we produce in our lives. Okay, So, so be careful here. The Pharisees... We're masters at fruit stapling. You know what I'm talking about. I've used that terminology before. It's a Paul David Tripp term. Like, like Paul David Tripp talks about fruit stapling. You take, you, you remember that, I don't know, some of you might have this kind of fruit, the, the, the decorative fruit that you have on your dining room table sometimes. We, we, I've seen that on people's tables. We might have had it uh, as a kid growing up. It's fake fruit. It's plastic. But it looks so shiny and real. And, and, and so, so the Pharisees were guilty of fruit stapling. They looked extremely righteous to everyone around them. Even Jesus said, you all look good on the outside, but on the inside, you are, you are dead. You are dead. You are lifeless. Like they had never taken the time to self-inspect that they would have, if they, had, if they had done that, they would have seen that while their outward fruit looked great to others, what it really was was a whole bunch of that plastic fruit. And when you go to bite into it, your teeth just kind of slide off of them. And you're like, seriously? What's going on with this? Give me some real fruit, man. Right? So the, so the attitudes, the speech, how they treated and related to others exposed what was going on in their hearts. The fruit of their life was fake because their righteousness was fraudulent and self-generated. Right? And so as we inspect our own fruit, it's helpful for us to go back to the Beatitudes and to ask ourselves the tough questions about why we do what we do. Do the mercies of my God, the God I profess to know and love, do his mercies actually live within me or are they self-generated? Are they self-produced? Right? Are we poor in spirit? Are we hungry for, for righteousness? Are we saddened over our own sin and the sin in the world? Are we, are we first saddened over our own wretchedness, our own sin? 
Are we producing in our lives, out of our hearts, by the power of the Spirit of God, the, the treasure box of Christ's Spirit, right? Where is that treasure box? It's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Paul says, against such things there is no law. So, so if we belong to Christ, then the, the treasure box of His Spirit will live within us it doesn't mean we'll live all that perfectly because none of us does that, right? There, there are times we can be judgmental and condemning and, and cantankerous, there's a good word, right? And, and angry. We need to repent of whatever is going on in our hearts and turn back to Christ and ask again for his mercies to be set right with him. Uh, picture number five, as we close, focuses on hearing and doing. Verses 46 through 49 why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. Is he, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Uh, the question of verse 46 is, if we consider it carefully, a question that will expose us to the reality that not everyone who calls Jesus Lord, Lord, truly belongs to him. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? Now, there's, there's a question that calls us to self. Again, not, not for our neighbor. It doesn't call me to examine you. It calls me to examine me. It calls you to examine you. Do I obey the Lord? Is that the, desire, is that the true, authentic desire of my heart to be found in obedience to God when I hear his word? And if the answer, friends, is no, then I have some business to do with God. And so it's a, it's a penetrating question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't obey me? In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm not really your Lord. You don't really believe. I, I'm not really Lord of your life. And he says in Matthew's account of this sermon... He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, I will turn to them and say, depart from me, I never knew you. How tragic is that going to be? Friend, don't hang, your, don't hang your hat, your eternal destination on a profession of faith you made when you were four, five, six, ten, twenty, whatever the case may be. Does your heart, is your heart growing in a desire to live obediently to Jesus? Has your heart been transformed? Has the, have the desires of your heart been turned? Can you trace God's working in your life? Not that you've never sinned. Again, none of us is sinless. But is there a growing desire from the point you gave yourself to Christ and you surrendered to him as Savior and Lord? Is there a growing desire in you, a growing bent to obey him, to be found in obedience? Your obedience doesn't save you. It's the fruit. It's the proof in the pudding, as they say. It's the proof that, that you and I truly know the Lord. If our hearts have been transformed and the true nature of our heart is to live for him and to obey him, so here's the question we should ask ourselves if we call Jesus Lord. You say, well, self, I call Jesus Lord, but do I do what he tells me to do in his word? Is there any evidence through my heartfelt obedience that Jesus is truly the Lord of my life? That's the question. And so this picture here in the end of Jesus' sermon is intended to help us. Jesus says, let me show you what that person who hears my words and obeys me, let me show you what he looks like. This is what that person looks like. Verse 48, 
right? He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke out against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Take note of the similarities between the man who wants to obey the Lord and the man who doesn't intend to obey him. Here's the similarities. They both hear the words of Jesus. They both hear the same words, right? They both set out to build a life. They're building a house. They hear the words of Jesus. They both set out to build a life. That is, they profess Jesus as Lord. They both experience the flood coming against their house. So, so those are the similarities. What are the differences? One builds on a foundation upon the rock, Jesus. The other takes a shortcut, does not build a foundation. He makes a profession of faith, but takes shortcuts. One, one hears and obeys while the other hears and does not obey. One, one's house stands in the storm. The other's crumble. The other house crumbles, right? So, so the storms of life test the foundations. They test the foundation of my profession of faith. The storms in your life test the foundations of the profession of faith you've made in Christ. Will we hold fast to Christ our anchor? See, only by His grace and only by His power will we hold fast to Him because it's not our good works that hold us. No, it's... it's, it's the, our obedience that proves our desire to obey and our effort to obey proves that we truly know the Lord. So choosing and following. Is, is the Jesus of the Bible truly your guide and teacher? Is he? Is he truly your guide and teacher? Is he truly my guide and teacher? Then seeing and being. When, when you inspect, when I inspect my heart, when you inspect your heart and life, what do you see that you've become and are becoming? What, am, what have I become and what am I becoming? See, see can, we, can we with confidence look at our own soul and say, I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus has changed my life because there's evidence that my desires are different than they used to be, and I can't do that. I can't do that. And then finally, hearing and doing. What kind of a hearer of God's word are you? And what kind of a hearer of God's word am I? Do we hear and obey or do we hear and ignore? See, those are the questions that I leave you with this morning to consider as we give an invitation here. Father, we ask that, Lord, during this time of closing, that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts Father, you would take your word. Your word says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so I pray that the spirit of God would take your word right in these moments and draw us. Draw us to Jesus. Draw us to yourself, Lord. And we ask that humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. The invitation is open. If you want to respond to the spirit of God, you come.